Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. On Apologetics, you have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo, and I am Gary Machuda, your host and sensei for this hour. Got a great show in store for you. Got a great week in store for you. Uh, Friday, we're going to have a good friend, Eric Robinson, come on from Polycarp's Paradigm, and uh, he's going to talk about his new book on the sacramental mind. Also, Thursday, we're going to have a new guest, uh, Father Gregory Pine. I know many of you are familiar with him at the, his work with Augustine Institute. We're going to talk about one of my favorite passages in uh, St. Thomas's Other Summa uh, regarding, uh, I guess you could say, regarding whether God causes evil. It's going to be a fascinating one. That's Thursday. Wednesday, we have a good friend, Ken Litchfield, come on. Tomorrow, Eric Ibarra. We're going to dive into the papacy, uh, looking at the after effects of the Council of Chalcedon. And today uh, we have Dr. John Bergsma coming up on the other side of the break. This is going to be part two of our <clears throat> series of talks on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And specifically, what did the Dead Sea Scrolls have to tell us uh, or uh, kind of um, bring out about Christianity? And you'd be surprised that some of the amazing parallels or perhaps prefigurements of Christianity you find there in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So he's going to be coming up on the other side of the break. Uh, by the way, you know, speaking of dates, don't forget, mark your calendars, June 13th. We have men's conference for Virgin Most Powerful Radio. You can sign up for it on virginmostpowerfulradio.org website. Where Jesse Rubin and Tim Gordon are going to be coming on, and uh, that's going to be a super high impact uh, men's conference indeed. And uh, also on June 20th, our good friend Steve Ray is also going to offer a virtual pilgrimage on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. So we got a couple of very special events coming up, and the beautiful thing is this is all going to be live stream so you know even if you're uh, maybe you're high risk you can't get out and do things uh, you can still access these conferences through virgin most powerful radio so check it out like i said it's on our website which is virgin most powerful and uh yeah lots of great stuff coming up for us in june so mark it down and participate folks also, I want to thank all of you for doing your apologetics in place, sharing the news about Virgin Most Powerful Radio, about hands-on apologetics. I want to thank you, all of you for subscribing and all of you who are about to subscribe to Hands-On Apologetics. Really appreciate that. And also, I want to give my shout-outs, as always, to our good friends watching live stream on Facebook, YouTube, and other platforms out there. Uh, welcome aboard, everybody. Hello. Uh, great to see some familiar names. And also... I want to thank all of you listening on radio around the United States and via podcasts around the world. Uh, so uh, welcome aboard, folks. The more the merrier when it comes to defending and explaining the faith. That's what I always say. Um, let's see. Uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Bergma, you can always give us a call toll-free at 888-526-2151. That's 888-526-2151. Or perhaps you have a question and you don't want to come to the mic, but uh, you just have an apologetics question. Maybe you're at work, you're in a situation, not really sure how to handle uh, objections to the faith or something like that. Or family members, let's face it. You know, many times uh, defending, explaining the faith, unfortunately, it takes place within families. So uh, if you do have those things, never fear. You can always send email to Hands On Apologetics, the dojo mailbox. And the address for that, of course, is questions at handsonapologetics.com. Let me say that again, questions at handsonapologetics.com. And, uh, yes, your emails do fly through to the Internet 
into the Dojo mailbox where I do answer them. So uh, thank you for your uh, emails, and, uh, you know, uh, please feel free to email us. By the way, I should also mention something. I know we have a lot of new people listening to the program, and uh, so uh, I just want you to know a couple of uh, websites. I have a handsonapologetics.com website. That's my own personal website with uh, apologetic information, also information about the show, and also if you're interested in any of my books or CDs or anything like that or MP3s, you can check out GaryMachuda.com as well. So I just want to throw that out there because I know we get a lot of new people every episode, and uh, I want to keep you all you know, on the same page because uh, the, that's what the dojo is all about, exercising our minds, our hearts, to be able to explain, defend the faith with clarity, charity, and confidence. And uh, for all you newbies out there, uh, we, every episode, during the first segment, we pick a Finding the Fallacy in which we pull out an informal fallacy uh, to uh, so that we're aware of fuzzy thinking and how to correct it. And also every episode, we meet an early church father. So if you're listening to the program regularly, you're going to learn a lot of informal fallacies, and you're also going to be able to uh, learn a little bit about an awful lot of early church fathers, which are so, so important for apologetics because they are witnesses to the ancient faith. And what is the finding the fallacy today, you ask? Well, let me answer. It's the appeal to ridicule. The appeal to ridicule. Uh, this particular fallacy has been used with great effect by new atheists, especially on uh, social media. Um, but, you know, as new atheism is dying out, uh, you still you still see a little bit of it out there, but it's still out there. Uh, not only there, but everywhere. And what is the appeal to ridicule? Well, the appeal to ridicule is informal fallacy, which presents an opponent's argument as absurd, ridiculous, or humorous, and therefore not worthy of serious consideration. So uh, just a word to the wise, whenever you're listening to someone arguing a, a position or arguing for or against something, if they begin to make fun out of their opponent's position, uh, dismiss it, ridicule it, um, your antenna should go up. Because really what they're doing is they're giving a social cue to the audience not to pay attention or, or to take seriously what the opponent is is arguing for. And, of course, that uh, has nothing to do with evidence or how sound the argument is. In fact, it's just an attempt to derail the opponent before he even gets a chance to get his case out. So just beware, you know, uh, ridiculing, calling things absurd, laughing at things. Uh, just realize that you're being manipulated through this informal fallacy. So that is our fallacy for today, the appeal to ridicule. Why don't we jump to the Meet the Early Church Father for today. Uh, today's Early Church Father is Familian of Caesarea. And I would say probably 99.9% .9 of you out there, unless you're really a Early Church Fathers junkie, probably never heard of Familian of Caesarea. Um, I know I, if, if I hadn't been preparing for the show over the past couple of years, I probably would never hear of him either. Well, uh, that is because he's kind of a minor figure, but nevertheless, he was important during a very um, controversial period. Vermilion was Bishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia. He was a contemporary of St. Gregory the Wonder Worker, and like the latter, he was a great admirer of origin of Alexandria. But he is remembered mostly for his moral support that he gave to Cyprian, when Bishop of Carthage uh, was quarreling with Pope St. Stephen I over the question of the baptism of heretics. And he uh, he died in the year 268 AD or shortly thereafter. Um, now, what's this controversy between uh, Cyprian and Pope St. Stephen? Well, Cyprian, of course, is a very important early church father, Latin, uh, North African church father, who, uh, for all other purposes, perfectly orthodox. However, uh, there was a question of whether or not the baptism of heretics was valid. 
And in North Africa, they were very strict and actually believed that, no, the, the baptisms were not valid. And therefore, if uh, someone was baptized in a heretical sect, they had to actually be rebaptized to come into the church. Now, this is regardless of, you know, whether or not it's a proper form, proper matter, proper intent. Uh, it was just something that was categorically denied by Cyprian, which put him in trouble, uh, in uh, direct conflict with Pope St. Stephen I. Why? Because Pope St. Stephen I uh, basically affirmed what has become the orthodox position in that, uh, yeah, the baptism of heretics is valid, you know, provided those three things, form, matter, and intent are there. And uh, so uh, there was this long struggle, and that's where Familian comes in, because Familian of Caesarea was really um, one of a group of North African bishops that were firmly behind Cyprian in the denial of uh, entrance without rebaptism. Uh, now, you might say, okay, if he's wrong on this issue, then why is he important for Catholic apologetics? Well, even though he's wrong on this particular issue, he still witnesses to the faith in different ways. Uh, for example, uh, quote, and I'll show you what I mean. And other heretics as well, uh, they have parted themselves from the church, can have nothing to do with power and grace, since all power and grace is settled in the church where preside presbyters, who possess the power for both baptizing, the imposing of hands, and ordaining. So, yes, he's wrong on the rebaptism issue, but he is right in that witnessing to the fact that the church is invested with these spiritual power and grace for baptism, imposing hands, and ordaining. Ah, did I hear the music coming up next? Dr. John Burke, oh, we're going to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls right after this. Stay tuned, folks. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family. Did you know my mom's going to have a baby? She is? Will it be a boy? Or will it be a girl? We don't know yet, but we heard the heartbeat, and my dad said this is going to be someone very special. You mean like being a president? Or maybe a doctor? Well, probably maybe like a singer or dancer, I think. Hello, my name is Marianne Koharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. We know that every baby is a miracle and has the potential to do great things. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please call 1-800-366-7773 or visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. Pro-Life Across America. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. 
And welcome back, everybody. Hands on apologetics. The Dead Sea Scrolls, these mysterious scrolls of uh, found from the Dead Sea community. Uh, do they have anything to tell us about Christianity? Well, with us today, this is part two of with uh, Dr. John Bergsma. Uh, Dr. Bergsma is a full professor of theology at Franciscan University of Steubenville in Steubenville, Ohio. Holds an MDiv and THM degrees from Kelvin Seminary in Grand Rapids. Uh, he also served as a Protestant pastor for four years before entering the church in 2001 while pursuing his Ph.D. in theology at the University of Notre Dame. He specializes in the Old Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls, graduating with high honors in 2004. He's also the author of several very good books. In fact, Dr. Bergsma, I was reading through your list and I, I saw the Catholic Introduction to the Bible Old Testament which actually I think is right over my over my shoulder in the live feed. Uh, what a fantastic work you and Dr. Petrie put together. Thanks a lot. I'm glad you like it, Gary. Um, it was really a labor of love, uh, something that we had been talking about writing for years and just wanted to get out there to provide um, priests and seminarians and catechists and just uh, Catholic lay people with, a one-stop shop for working with the Old Testament, um, you know, a book they could go to and look up anything that they, you know, were studying on any book that they were, book of the Old Testament that they were working on and, and find all the materials they need to understand it from a Catholic perspective. And we're happy with how it turned out, and people have been liking it. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. In fact, I read the entire thing in two days. Uh it was very accessible and uh, lots of great info. Is there anything in the works for a New Testament introduction? Uh, yes, there is. We're about halfway done with that. I have uh, 500 pages to proofread on my hard drive here <laughs> from Dr. Petrie. And uh, it'll shortly be uh, working on the next 500 pages. So Nice. We're going to try to keep it to the same size as the Old Testament uh, volume, though. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, you have to uh, let me know when it comes out. I'll have you on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Love to talk about it. Okay. Well, you know, we're not here to talk about the intro to the Old Testament. We're talking about the uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls intro to Christianity with your book, Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, the uh, last program, we kind of gave a quick recap of what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. We probably have some new listeners uh, maybe if you could just really quickly explain what are these scrolls that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So, Gary, um, <clears throat> like we talked about last week, the Dead Sea Scrolls are the remains of a Jewish monastic library from what we may just as well call a Jewish monastery that was on the shores of the Dead Sea, the northwest shore of the Dead Sea, um, probably held about 100 to 200 uh, monks, men, uh, living in community, celibately, studying scriptures. And they hid their library before they got wiped out by the Romans, probably around the year 70. And this library probably originally consisted of a thousand books written on scrolls. Now, of course, there was some deterioration, um, but uh, in 1947 or, th or thereabouts, um, three uh, Bedouin shepherds stumbled into these caves uh, and found some of them, brought them to antiquities dealers, and after a couple of years, people realized how ancient these scrolls were, and then the hunt was on to find all the scrolls and all the, sc the caves, and over the past 50 years, They've all been brought out, transcribed, photographed, published, etc. And among them are our oldest copies of Scripture, like a complete copy of the book of Isaiah from about 250 years before Jesus was born, which is just amazing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, partial copies of other Old Testament biblical books. And then a lot of... Um, the writings that you would expect to find in a monastic library, things like commentaries and lectionaries and uh, uh, rules for common life and, uh, you know, prophecies and uh, end times literature and all of that. It's all there. So it it's, uh, makes for fascinating reading because it gives you a picture 
of how these very devout Jewish men who were living in the time of our Lord during his lifetime and the lifetime of the apostles gives us a picture of how they looked at the world and what their beliefs were, what their expectations were, and a lot of it has very interesting um, intersections with the Gospels and things we know from the New Testament. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, I think uh, the last time you were on, we kind of touched a little bit on it, but that they have a kind of sacramental realism that kind of points towards what eventually becomes the Catholic faith, the understanding of sacraments and uh, that they really affect what they symbolize. Yeah, you know, that was a real shock for me, Gary, you know, coming from a Protestant background myself, where we tend to view the sacraments as uh, just symbols uh, of our faith in Jesus. Um, And I know growing up, I certainly looked at the Catholic Church and thought, you know, this this idea that baptism is salvific or that Jesus' real presence is really in the Eucharist, I thought those were all, um, you know, medieval inventions, like that was medieval superstition, and that if you went back to the early church, you know, they just regarded these things as merely symbols. But, you know, the, the question is, how did Jews look at things back in those days? And when I was studying this, the Dead Sea Scrolls in graduate school, it's so interesting how they, they baptized daily in this monastic community, Gary, they would wash every day before their meal at noon, and and they speak about the Holy Spirit moving through the waters and forgiving them of their sins. So it's very close to, like, a Catholic baptismal theology. Now, do I think they had the Holy Spirit? No. I think the Holy Spirit was poured out by the Christ, you know, at Pentecost. But they were getting ahead of themselves, but they, they were moving in the right direction where things were going to go. And then, yeah. Gary, after they had this, this uh, after they washed, they would have their evening, the, uh, sorry, their afternoon meal uh, at about noon, where they would eat bread and wine together, and it was according to ritual. They had to be um, presided over by a priest, reach out his hand first and bless the elements before anybody else could eat. They all sat in order of seniority when they would sit at this meal. And this is a very sacred time for them, Gary, because it marked their participation in what they called the New Covenant. They believed that they were, they were it. They were what Jeremiah prophesied back in Jeremiah 31 about the coming of a New Covenant. They thought they already had it, and that this, um, this meal that they shared together, that was the mark of your full participation, because for the first two or three years, that you're part of the community, Gary, you, you couldn't share that meal. They called it the pure food of the many. But when you're finally, you know, met all your tests and requirements and have been faithful for three years or so, they would admit you to that meal. And then that was a sign of being in the new covenant. And they believed that that meal would continue when the Messiah came, and that when the Messiah came, he would share uh, that meal with them. So, uh, you know, it's all, it's all fascinating stuff. I mean, the, the, the connections with the Eucharist are, are obvious. I mean, the, the, the parallels there. Um, and coming up here on Corpus Christi, it's, you know, really fascinating uh, to reflect on this. Um, but one thing they never went to, Gary, was, was uh, an idea of the Messiah's body actually being the bread. You know, that, that is a, a new step that our Lord takes um, at the institution of the Eucharist that's really not anticipated by anything they did. You know, other, other aspects mm-hmm. of the deal, yes, but this, you know, the, the Messiah becoming the bread is so fascinating and mind-blowing. And, but it was prophesied, Gary, back in Isaiah um, 42 and 49, where Isaiah said that one day the servant would come, and the servant is his language for the Messiah. And Isaiah said that the servant would become a covenant. Uh, He would be given as a covenant to the people. And that's such fascinating language, because how can a person become a covenant? You, you You can write a covenant, you can form a covenant, but how can a person become a covenant? Only, I think, in hindsight, can we understand this in light of Luke 22, where uh, our Lord says, this is my body, this is my blood, and this cup is the new covenant 
in my blood, which means consisting of my blood. So there at the Last Supper, he is giving his body and blood, and he's identifying the gift of his body and blood as the new covenant. And that's a fulfillment of what Isaiah said 700 years earlier, that that in some mysterious way, God's special servant was going to become the covenant. And I I just can't get over this stuff. Every time I talk about it, it makes me excited. (laughs) Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Yeah, just the implications of all that. yeah, as as you were talking about the uh, the the meal for the many in uh, the Qumran community, it's like boy, there's just all these little prefigurements. Like uh, for example, I was thinking that like the catechumenate, uh, you know, they don't uh, participate in the Eucharistic supper until uh, after they're received in the church, and so there's even a kind of parallel there with Qumran. Exactly. Yeah, they had a catechumenate, or you could also look at it as something like a like a postulancy and a novitiate uh, too. But um, but yeah, they had this this period of preparation, this period of formation, and that was all overseen by the head of the community, um, who was called in Hebrew a mabaker. But if you try to translate that term into Greek, you come up with episkopos, which is of course the word that gives us bishop. So, you know, their community was quite literally governed by a bishop. Um, And, you know, one of the reasons, you know, that that just blows my mind. One of the reasons that's so fascinating, Gary, is that when in, in, um, in the academic world, one of the arguments that's used against Christianity is that, oh, uh, Jesus and, and the apostles, they didn't set up a church, you know, because they expected uh, the Messiah to return at any time, you know, so why set up an organization with a hierarchy, you know, governed by an authority figure like a bishop when you're expecting, you know, the Messiah to come back at any time. But the thing about it was the, uh, these, this Qumran community was precisely organized in that way. Excuse me, and I'm going to, oh, there we go. I thought I had a sneeze coming on. But anyway, um, the, this Kumar community, they were organized, they had a hierarchy, they had a bishop, they had, you know, also a priesthood and, 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 a, and an order of Levites, which would be like the diaconate in the Catholic Church, even though they expected the Messiah to show up at any time. And, mm-hmm. you know, so, so the, the quick organization of the Church that we see, you know, where the Church quickly gets itself organized and acts and, and has these roles of leadership and so on, that didn't need to take any time. That needed, didn't need to take generations. That could have happened quickly because there's already a pattern for it in existence. Wow. That's great. We're chatting with Dr. John Bergsma about the Dead Sea Scrolls and Christianity. Stay tuned for more to come on the other side of the break. Hi, this is Jesse Romero from the Terry and Jesse Show, also from Jesus 911. Let's face it, we all need to use the internet, but we need screen accountability. Why? Pornography is a huge problem, especially on the internet. And every time we tap into the internet, we get bombarded with images and temptations that degrade our humanity. So we need Covenant Eyes to block these pornographic sites and advertisements from infiltrating our lives. Covenant Eyes helps us take custody of our eyes and custody of our intellect. So I recommend you go to CovenantEyes.com and type in the promo code BMPR to support the network. Protect yourself and your family from the imminent threats on the internet. It's www.CovenantEyes.com code VMPR live porn free thank you for listening to Virgin Most Powerful Radio thank you God bless you keep the faith
Coming up on the next Empowered by the Spirit with Deacon Steve Greco. This show is one of the most important shows that we've done because it's a focus on the current pandemic, COVID-19. Bishop David is filled with the Holy Spirit, someone who is right in tune with what we need to do to grow spiritually. And I'm so excited to put it on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. This is a show that will give us encouragement and will give us hope. Catch Empowered by the Spirit Fridays after the Terry and Jesse Show on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, Hands-On Apologetics. And we're talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, what they have to tell us about Christianity. And, you know, Dr. Bergsma, before the break, you just unloaded a really, really important uh uh, important thing about uh, that the Dead Sea Scroll community had this structure, authoritative structure, that kind of mirrors what comes about in Christianity with bishop, priest, and deacon. Uh, you know, and as you were talking, I was thinking about Ignatius of Antioch, where uh, mm-hmm. Ignatius, um, of course, you know, scholars say that uh, the question is authenticity because he comes out with so strongly with this threefold uh, uh, priestly order, you know, that seems to just pop out of nowhere. And of course, you know, he also says that the bishop is the one who celebrates the valid Eucharist or somebody that the bishop appoints. So this actually is kind of anticipated by the Dead Sea community. It is indeed, um, Gary, you know, and and Ignatius of Antioch uh, was very powerful in my conversion. Um, you know, it's really largely reading his letters that uh, convinced me that the early church was the Catholic Church and that I had to submit to uh, the Catholic Church. And that was back in uh, uh, 2000, well, 99, 2000, and then I eventually came in 2001. But, uh, but you're absolutely right. One of the statements from Ignatius of Antioch that shook me up was, uh, where he says only that Eucharist is valid, which is authorized by your bishop, and um, you know that that hit me on two fronts because uh, growing up as a Protestant, first of all, we didn't believe in bishops, and we also didn't believe in the Eucharist. Um, we didn't call <laughs> it the Eucharist; we called it communion. You know, and and I remember sitting in a church government class and having my professor tell us one day that. The basic principle of Calvinist church government, because I was in a Calvinist tradition, was uh, no bishops need apply. <laughs> so we <laughs> basically thought that bishops were unbiblical, etc. And here Ignatius of Antioch is saying, um, you know, only that Eucharist is valid again, which is authorized by your bishop. And a lot of other things flow from that, you know, that because some Protestants have the idea that, oh, yeah, the Eucharist is important, but any Christian can confect it, like anybody can make their own Eucharist anywhere. Well, that would lead to terrible abuses, of course, but uh, that's also not the witness of the earlier church. The early church said no. It was, you know, those who were in succession for the apostles were the only ones that had the authority to do that. But getting back to the scrolls, Gary, um, yeah, when you look at what Ignatius says about the bishop, you can find all kinds of parallels in the um, regulation documents, like the uh, the community rule uh, from this Qumran monastery, uh, where they have the rules for their common life. They are just as emphatic that the overseer, uh, they use the Hebrew word for bishop, uh, you know, he he is the authority in the community, and nothing may take place in the community without his permission. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things he's responsible for, too, is, is uh, investigating catechumens and making sure that uh, those who are coming into the community actually uh, know 
the scriptures and have a good grasp on the faith. And um, it, it's fascinating to see the parallel there because to this day, you know, in the confirmation rite, we at least have, you know, kind of a, a little pro forma, you know, investigation by the bishop where the bishop will ask, you know, the kids, uh, you know, the 12-year-olds or whatever, you know, a couple of questions just to kind of represent that. Actually, the kids are supposed to have been tested, you know, before they showed up for church at confirmation. Everybody crosses their fingers and holds their breath and hopes that nobody says anything embarrassing. <laughs> but, uh, we, 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 we retain that sense that the bishop is supposed to, you know, test and be responsible for making sure that folks know what they're doing when they join. And that was already taking place at the Qumran community. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's funny. But yeah, that's uh, I mean, that shows basically that, you know, Christianity, you know, it just didn't pop out ex nihilo. You know, it, many of the distinctively Catholic practices and beliefs were all already well, you know, uh, imbibed in the ancient Middle East and even in Qumran, maybe even especially in Qumran. Yeah, definitely. You know, uh, it shows also how Jewish our faith is. I mean, the more you get into this, the more continuity you see there. And part of the reason, Gary, that we don't see more of the Jewishness of our Catholic faith is that modern Judaism really grows out of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, you know, were, were different. They didn't practice monasticism. They didn't have these tight-knit communities to the same degree they didn't have that uh, that sacramental sense about the washing and the common meal and so on. And so, you know, the, the Pharisees represented a, kind of a different development in, in the trajectory of Judaism. But this group, the Essenes, that had this monastic community, uh, their sense of themselves and, and the way that they were interpreting the scriptures is so much closer to, you know, our, our Lord and the Apostles, and you see the, the similarities there so much stronger. But then, of course, their monastery was destroyed in the year 70, and most people forgot about it. Um, but, you know, in, in rediscovering the scrolls and, and getting into their life and their thought, it shows us a form of Judaism that um, has a lot of commonality, a lot of resonance, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, affinity with uh, with the early church, and it helps us to see how these things, you know, develop naturally from what God was doing with the people of Israel, and then what he was doing with the Jewish people after the exile, and then right up into the time of our Lord, there's this development and this gradual appreciation of the scriptures more and more. Yeah, 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 very good. I know in the popular imagination, we often think of Judaism, first century Judaism, as uh, monolithic, but it was anything but monolithic, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, there there is some very you know strong differences uh, between these different uh, groups of Jews. I mean, you had the Sadducees who only held to the five books of Moses as scriptural, and you had the Pharisees who had a larger collection of scripture and uh, different beliefs. You know, obviously angels in the afterlife, the Pharisees would believe in those, whereas the Sadducees wouldn't. The Essenes believed in angels, in the afterlife. Um, they had a liturgy where, you know, they believed that when they were worshiping, they were being, they were actually present spiritually to the angels and the holy ones who had gone before them. And when you read some of their worship literature, Crowd of the Dead Sea Scrolls, Gary, it reminds you of Mass. You know, we talk about you know being united to the angels and the saints when we're when we're in Mass. They they had that sense that if you're truly worshiping, that you're you're present with the angels and with the holy people, uh, the saints who've gone before. And um, so yeah, so you get these you, you get quite a bit of difference between these different groups of Jews, and then also you got to factor in the Samaritans who had their own temple up on Mount Gerizim, many miles to the north of uh, Jerusalem. And uh, we see them in John 4, we see them in Luke 10 and elsewhere. And in Acts 6, the apostles go out, and that's often thought of as the first confirmation. Speaking about confirmation was when the apostles went to the Samaritans who had been baptized but hadn't uh, fully received the Holy Spirit. And that's where Peter and John laid hands on them to 
you know, seal them with the Holy Spirit. And so in this, you know, this time of year when we're having a lot of confirmations in many dioceses, it's interesting to think that, um, you know, you had the Samaritans up there who were receiving that from the apostles, but the Samaritans were descendants of northern Israel, and they had different beliefs as well. So, yeah, the, the you know, the, the religion of the Jews and the Samaritans in the time of our Lord was broken up into very different camps, different uh, denominations, if you will, and uh, really everybody was waiting for the Messiah to come and, and, and set things right. <laughs> and what we believe yeah. as Catholics is he did come, <laughs> and he set things set things right for his followers. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, uh, talking about liturgy, um, I, I don't know anything about this, but uh, were they still tied to the sacrificial cult in Jerusalem, or uh, you know, did they participate in the feast like all the other Jews, or what was their liturgy? What surrounded their liturgy, in other words? Yeah, great question, great question, um, and it's so interesting because it it helps us understand the Gospels better. But they did not participate in the temple, even though they were so devout. But they would not go to the temple, and they would not um, offer sacrifice up there because they considered it defiled um, because of the hypocrisy and, and various, um, we might think of them as canon law violations that uh, were being committed and allowed to happen by uh, the priesthood. Um, a little bit of backstory on this, Gary, is, um, you know, the, the legitimate high priesthood that, go, that went all the way back to uh, Old Testament times that actually got displaced around the year 150 when one of the Maccabean kings um, just took over the high priesthood like a political act, like, you know, the, the prime minister of Italy just making himself pope by force or something like this. And, um, and, and that corrupted the priesthood. Many people think the Essene movement started at that time. And, but why that's relevant to us when we read the Gospels, Gary, is that when you read about people like Annas and Caiaphas uh, in the Gospels, you got to remember that these guys are kind of like imposters, okay? They didn't have the right bloodline, and they knew it, okay? They, they held their position by political power, and it was uh, pretty much a farce, okay? And, and so you see that contrast in the Gospels when, when our Lord is being tried. Our Lord is the true high priest. And, and by the way, the, the high priest had a seamless robe. That was one of his marks of office. And, you, of course, you see that seamless robe on, on our Lord as a, you know, kind of a, 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 a theological sign of our Lord's true high priesthood. But anyway, in John 18, when our Lord's being tried by Annas and Caiaphas and so on, you see this real contrast between the sincerity and legitimacy of our Lord and these, these imposters. Very good. I'll hold that thought. Uh, we're coming up to the break. We're chatting with Dr. John Bergsma about his book, Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Stay tuned, folks. Welcome, Daniel. You're on the line. What's on your mind, brother? Hi, I just wanted to share a testimony about Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I had a buddy at work who, you know, he's a lukewarm Catholic guy, and I wanted him to start listening to the Terry and Jesse show, so I kept telling him to download the app, and he kept putting me off. So one day, I grabbed his phone, and I downloaded the app for him. I went on vacation, and you know, I kept telling him to listen to it. He was kind of put me off. I came back from vacation. He comes to my cubicle, and he says to me, Hey, man, I've been listening to Terry and Jesse's show, and it's great. And it's uh, made a big impact in his life. The guy, he's going to weekly adoration a couple times a wow. week. He goes to the Mass in the morning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he's an uh, on-fire Catholic, and he promotes the Terry and Jesse show on the Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Daniel, what a testimony, and I want to encourage our listeners to get those cards by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and uh, do what Daniel's doing. Go out and spread the faith by inviting people to listen to Virgin Most Powerful. Daniel, thanks for your testimony, brother. God love you. You're welcome.
Healthcare news today seems to be coming from everywhere and everyone. It's confusing, at least, and untrustworthy at the worst. Dr. Asetta is a faithful Catholic in the Kern County community. He is trustworthy, well-researched, and will only give expert opinion on matters in his own specialty. Catholic teaching at its entirety is of utmost importance to Dr. Asetta. Give Dr. Asetta a call for your obstetrics and gynecological needs at 661-695-6617. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. And just a reminder, June 13th, don't forget, we have the men's conference with Jesse Romero, Ruben Nava, and Tim Gordon. And also, June 20th, our good friend Steve Ray is going to have a virtual pilgrimage all of that's going to be available through a uh, live stream on uh, Virgin Most Powerful Radio. You can check out the website for details. And for those just tuning in, we were talking with John Bergsma about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I was asking him about their liturgy, and he was d- discussing how they've separated themselves from the sacrificial cult in Jerusalem because a Maccabean king had usurped the priesthood. And so Annas and Caiaphas, uh, they really don't have the legitimacy to exercise the high priestly office. Is that correct? Not according to, yeah, not according to biblical law. You know, they did not have the legitimate line of descent going back to uh, Zadok, who was high priest under Solomon, and then ultimately back to Aaron. You know, they had some priestly blood, I'm sure, but um, or at least Levitical blood, but uh, but everyone knew that the the, the, bl- the proper bloodline had been pushed out, you know, by force uh, back around the year 150. Of course, they would, would have, uh, it would have been 150 to them. You know, they're counting their years by the reigns of their own kings and such, but um, <clears throat> that's that's the case. And, and so you also, Gary, when you see our Lord cleansing the temple in John 2, for example, or in the other Gospels just before Passion Week, um, you know, and, and just that, that kind of round rebuke of what's going on in the temple, um, that, you know, really resonates, Gary, with, with what a lot of Jews felt. You know, the, the Essenes certainly, and the Essenes had a lot of sympathizers as well. And we see that our Lord, um, you know, with, with, uh, with qualifications, but uh, also, um, you know, stands in judgment on the hypocrisy and the abuses that were taking place uh, in the temple. So it gives us a kind of a sense of the times that among Jews themselves, there was a feeling that things were not, you know, that the the liturgy was not being conducted rightly by the right people. And uh, and there was a real need, again, for the Messiah, for a true high priest, for someone to come and set this all right. I mean, you know, if, if, uh, if we were in a position where, uh, you know, the Vatican became wholly corrupt and, you know, was using Buddhist uh, liturgy or something like that, you know, we'd probably all stick our heads between our knees and just say, Jesus, come now, you know? <laughs> and right. to a certain extent, that's, that's what it was like for many really devout Jews to just look at the abuses and, and what had take place and the political uh, infiltration of the whole temple system, and we're just saying, Lord, send us the Messiah, and that's what the Lord did, and that's what you see in the Gospels. Okay, yeah. So so when the Dead Sea community, when they, what did they use in place of their feast? Like you mentioned they have the, that daily meal. Well, that's not Passover. Uh, was it in any way connected to uh, a sacrificial system, or was it consciously disconnected from it? Yeah. Great, uh, great question again, and um, there is, it is a bit of a debate among scholars 
but uh, it's clear, Gary, they continued to celebrate the whole calendar. So they would mark the feast days, and they had special prayers for every feast. One of the things that they did was uh, substitute prayer uh, for some of the rituals that they could not perform because they weren't at the temple. But then it's a, it's a current debate um, uh, among scholars whether they uh, offered sacrifice right down there on the shores of the Dead Sea uh, at their own community or whether they just completely separate, um, substituted prayer and, um, and, and, and worship instead of uh, animal sacrifice. We do find the remains of a lot of animals, uh, sacrificial animals, um, uh, that appear to have been eaten, that uh, they put the bones in pots, and they, they stored these pots uh, outside the community. And so currently, Gary, there's a, there's a debate raging among Dead Sea Scroll scholars about you know, was this just uh, their leftovers, in, you know, ancient <laughs> Tupperware? Or uh, was, this, uh, was this, you know, the remains of sacrifices that they, they didn't want to destroy the animal bones because they were sacred, because they had been sacrificed to God? It was a bit of a discussion. But what is clear is they wouldn't participate up in the, in the um, temple up in Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. But, but, and they were very dedicated to worship, too, and that's a beautiful example. I mean, they had, uh, you know, uh, very uh, devout prayers for, for every day of the year. They had uh, prayers for uh, all the feast days in the Jewish calendar. They had some extra feast days. You know, so these are, these are men that were, you know, like, like monks of our own day, really dedicated to prayer and the liturgy uh, and living a common life. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned also uh, that uh, in these liturgical documents that they spoke of being in the presence of the angels and also the righteous who have died. Um, what was their view of the after as far as we can tell from these scrolls? Yes, they had a really robust view of the afterlife. Um, they believed in, um, you know, the resurrection of the dead. Um, they believed in um you know, a a, uh, a a world to come where, uh, which would be perfect, where they would be in God's presence um, and uh, and worship God in his in his heavenly temple, uh, much like you see in the Book of Revelation. Um, so a lot of that imagery in Revelation, where you have angels and saints, don't you? You've got the twenty four elders. You've had you have the um, the martyrs uh, under the altar. You've got the angels surrounding, uh, et cetera. Um, you've got the uh, uh, the 144,000 um, uh, virgins, you know, the, the men who have kept themselves from uh, women. I think I'm getting, I hope I'm getting that number right. <laughs> That's right, 144,000, yeah. Yeah, 144,000 who have kept themselves from women. You know, and that, that points out also their celibacy. You know, Gary, one of the reasons why they were living celibacy you know, there's more than one reason why they did that, but but uh, also that's that's how they viewed the um, you know the angelic life and and the life in heaven uh, was not going to be the married life, but they like the angels were going to be gathered around the throne in in worship, and so they were already living that future life here on earth, that life dedicated to worship and 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 not uh, you know to raising a family and doing the other natural things. That they're usually associated with this uh, with this temporary life, so you see that reflected in the Gospels as well. You know, our Lord's teaching about celibacy, um, how He commends it. We think of how our Lord, uh, in fact, talks about those who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, and 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 says that those who can receive that ought to receive that. You know, that that lifestyle uh, is is really admirable, and and that always. He fuddled me, Gary, when I was a kid growing up. I was like, well, he, he must be talking about people who are living celibate lives in his, in his, among his contemporaries, because Jesus says there are some who make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom, like, like right now, his own yeah. contemporaries. But I thought, like many people do, that Jews just don't practice celibacy, and so I was at total loss to figure out who Jesus was speaking about in Matthew 19 there, but... In hindsight, he's speaking about these Essene communities, like down at Qumran, and he's he's commending them 
uh, for this this lifestyle of prayer and, and dedication to worship. Yeah, I know that's uh, there was a lot of scholarly pushback at the idea that the Qumran community was uh, was a celibate community, and uh, and you know, and also with the Gospels too. You know that this idea of uh, uh, celibacy and uh, ideal of virginity was utterly foreign to the Jewish mind. Yeah, I think that's a lot more the result of modern ideology that, you know, is really obsessed with sexuality and, and doesn't want to admit that anybody could live without it or uh, yeah. or that there could be a different conceivable lifestyle. But yeah, you're right, Gary, there, there has been a a lot of pushback and attempts to try to um, uh, say that the Qumran community were not celibate, but there's so many lines of evidence that confirm that. There's an ancient um, graveyard uh, with individual men, uh, about a thousand individual graves of men um, uh, buried right outside the community. Uh, We have um, three ancient historians that remark on the fact that they were celibate. And uh, we just have so many other evidence that, um, so much other evidence that confirms that their community rule, their internal documents um, don't have any provision for children or women being present. It's all the rules are geared toward adult males. Um, so I, I go through it in the book, but it's uh, it's, it's pretty strong, strong evidence that they, they live the celibate lifestyle there. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I love the tie-in with uh, that they make themselves eunuch for the kingdom of God. To tell you the truth, I never thought about it from that perspective, but you're right. He is referring to more than, you know, just one or two people. I mean, it's it must be a reference to the Dead Sea Scrolls community. Yeah, I really think it is uh, a reference to the Essenes there. Um, and it, it just one of the, uh, you know, a number of instances where, knowing a little bit more about the culture through the lens of that community, um, you know, can help us have a better sense of what our Lord is saying and, and, uh, and what the apostles are saying too in some of the epistles. Yeah. We only have uh, just a couple of minutes. I just want to ask, uh, did, what were their views on marriage? Yeah, they had very strong views on marriage. Um, uh, Gary, you know, they, they, uh, they upheld uh, lifelong uh, monogamy. Um, they did not believe in, in having any kind of multiple wives. Uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, really it's just absolutely fascinating, Gary, because when our Lord is challenged on this, for example, in the question of, uh, you know, Moses in, in divorce, again, Matthew 19 there, you know, the Pharisees come to Jesus with this debate, and, uh, and our Lord says, well, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And then our Lord goes back to the pattern of Adam and Eve, one man, one woman for life before the fall. And our Lord grounds his view of marriage back there in Genesis. And these, uh, these Essenes did the same thing. They had a, a, a phrase, Yasod Maria, which means the principle of creation. And that's what they used to justify lifelong monogamy, no divorce, no multiple wives. Wow, that's fascinating. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, Gary. Thanks for having me on. All right, that's Dr. John Bergsma, and the book is Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Check it out, folks. Lots of great stuff, and, man, I can't believe the hour has flown. It's already right, time to shut down the Midwest Command Center, turn off the dojo lights. Thank you so much for tuning in, but never fear. Coming up next, Terry and Jesse will soon be here with the Terry and Jesse show. Hope everybody has a great day. God willing, we'll be back again. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye, everybody. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, 
you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church, so I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.